Hello and welcome to a special episode of L&D Disrupt. If you're an eagle-eyed or eagle-eared listener, you might have noticed that the last episode was number 49, which means L&D Disrupt is about to turn half a century old. And as we gear up for episode 50, I wanted to take you through some of the lessons and tips that have changed the way I look at people development forever. Expect to learn why leadership is about far more than titles, the ways we can actually improve onboarding, why AI might just scale our problems rather than solve them, how L&D teams can reduce friction for learners, and much, much more. 50 feels like a massive milestone for us, so I just wanted to thank everyone who's listened, who's joined us live, and appeared on the show. Two very quick things before we get into these 13 lessons. This follows on from 37 lessons for a winning L&D strategy, a guide that we published at the end of 2022 to bring together the best practical advice and tips from podcast guests, including Lavinia Mehedintu, Ross Stevenson, Kevin M. Yates, Bob Mosher, Philip Lamb, and many others to help you become a better problem solver, collaborator, change manager, and much more. Head to gethownow.com forward slash disrupt or use the first link in the description to download your copy. And now on to our exciting plans for episode 50. Egla Vinoskaita is joining us for an honest conversation about AI in L&D and how we can move beyond the gimmicks, overcome the challenges and start to use it more intentionally. That episode will be taking place on Wednesday the 20th of September at 11am UK time. And we'll be giving away a few prizes, including an L&D book bundle containing Learning Ecosystems by Katia Schipperhein, Agile HR by Natal Denk, and Nelson Sivalingham's Learning at Speed, all former guests of the show. You can head to lu.ma forward slash AI dash four dash learning, or just use the second link in the description to save your spot, join us live, and be in with a chance of winning. And now we can get into these 13 new lessons from L&D experts. Our first lesson comes from Chichi Erichalu, and it is that leadership is a behavior, not a title. We often mistake leadership as something that's linked to the organizational hierarchy or having a managerial role and title, but leaders are anyone that people want to follow. To quote Chichi, she said that there are a lot of people who are quietly leading because of the nature of how they carry themselves how they inspire others, and the way that they know leadership comes from caring and carrying people along. I think we can all think of or relate to those examples where we don't necessarily turn to our manager when we have a problem or need information. We turn to a colleague that we trust. All those people we respect because they are carrying themselves in a great way every day and helping shape the culture from the ground up as opposed to trying to influence it from the top down. And at the heart of this, I think there's one key theme. There are people that we feel obligated to follow and there are people that we want to follow. And where we sit on that spectrum has a huge influence on how motivated we are, the work we do, how we learn, how we collaborate with those people. And I think for people teams, there are two big things to consider here. Do we have the relationships where people are inspired and want to follow us or do they feel obligated to engage with what we do? And are we identifying the people that others naturally want to follow as we build out our content with internal experts, try to build project teams or create those advocates that will get others on board? Lesson two is that we spend too much time focusing on the what and not enough time focusing on the how. And this lesson came from Ron Stock who said, when we speak about the what, we're really talking about setting targets and setting goals, but there isn't enough focus on how we got there. And Ron gave this really great example that I love. Let's imagine a company who set these massive targets for the next three months, even though they know it's going to quadruple the workload for their team. And by some miracle, they get there. A lot of companies would treat that as a win and move on with the expectation that we could do it again in the future. But if they don't stop to reflect on the how or the journey to those outcomes, they might never learn things like the relationships have been destroyed in the process. Employee stress could be really high or the morale could be really low, meaning that we've hit short-term goals at the expense of our foundations for long-term success. And I think what Ron was really getting at here is that the mindset should be, it's not growth at all costs, it's growth responsibly. 
And part of growing responsibly is not just learning lessons about the outcomes we achieve, but always reflecting on the lessons learned about the journey to get to those outcomes so we can repeat the wins and learn from the failures the next time we do it. It's only taken us three lessons to get onto the topic of AI, but I've got a brilliant lesson from Philip Lamb on this one, who explained that AI will only scale our problems if we don't have the basics in place. Now, Google searches for terms like AI for learning and AI content are at their peak right now. And that means it can be easy to get caught up in the hype and start using AI for the sake of it. But Philip explained this to me. If your team is lacking the right skills and you don't have the right strategy, using AI will just exacerbate all of your flaws. So you can create more problems rather than solving problems. And there's this do more mindset with AI that really illustrates Philip's point. We might decide to use AI to scale our content creation, except right now we have this problem where our current content just doesn't engage people or resonate with them, and we haven't realized it yet. So if we decide to just create more content, we'll only create more of the stuff that doesn't work. Hence Philip's point of scaling the problems. Instead, we would have to nail the principles of getting content to engage people first before we even think about scaling it. Now, if we zoom out a level, we could say that for L&D to have any meaningful impact using AI, we would have to be adept at identifying problems, delivering solutions, defining what outcomes or success look like. If those aren't in place, then we don't really stand a chance. But if they are, we know which activities are going to drive impact, and then we can say, well, I don't have the skills or capacity for that part of the activity, but maybe AI could help. So that could be writing out a personalized plan for each person, or it could be data analysis, something maybe you don't have time or the skill set for. AI could plug that gap, and that's how we could start using it in a meaningful and intentional way to drive more impact. Lesson four is one that I really love. I picked up from Lauren Schultz in this really interesting conversation about how she transitioned from a different role to an L&D role. And the lesson is, you don't need to be in the thing to do the thing. Lauren explained how before she even officially joined the L&D team, she started creating learning content. So one lunch break, she built this one pager for new recruiters to give them some much needed context about the business. And she found out that the thing she was producing largely for her own enjoyment was really useful and beneficial to others. Lauren told me that I could look at this thing and say, I did this in an hour and a half with very limited training and zero resources. This is a low investment thing that I tried out for myself and had a win. Imagine what I could do if I had the full time and energy. Now for Lauren, this was part of her justification to move into the L&D team, but it's a mindset that we can all apply. What's something that we could do now off our own back without necessarily getting all of the sign off that builds a better case for us doing something else in the future? Or what's one thing that we're passionate about that we'd like to get into and we could start making progress towards that today before we're even officially getting into the thing or getting signed off to be part of that thing. And personally for me, this is a lesson that I've taken away and applied and tried to be more proactive about the things I'd like to do more of rather than waiting for the opportunity to come to me. Next, we're gonna move on to two quick fire lessons all about onboarding. And the first is, when you collect feedback matters, which I learned from Harriet and Dara at And Digital. Now, I don't know about your onboarding experiences, but the only time I've ever really been asked for feedback is at the end, that three month mark, the six month mark, whenever the onboarding process officially comes to an end. But I'm rarely asked during onboarding or once I'm in the role. But what I learned from Dara and Harriet is that these are two of the best times to ask for feedback. If we're asking questions during onboarding, then we can course correct anything that's not clear or not working. So if we're asking people whether they feel they have knowledge or skills to perform a task and they say no, we can course correct and add more of that information into the onboarding process. If we ask people how useful onboarding was now they're actually in the role, we can tweak it the next time we hire someone else in a similar position. So for example, somebody six months into the job might say, there just wasn't enough information on how to use tool X during the onboarding process. That's something we could rectify moving forward. At the core of this is about baking in those opportunities to ask feedback at the right moments. And I'll end this one with a quote from Harriet who said, 
rather than waiting until the end of the entire thing. We have these weekly retros where we get much quicker views on where things have landed. We have daily stand-ups with our onboarding coordinator, plus regular reflection Q&A sessions. Lesson six is about building purpose sessions into your onboarding process. Something I learned from Fiona Morgan, Chief Purpose Officer at SailGP. Now people aren't going to understand your company's purpose by accident. So if you can introduce these sessions where you talk about the backstory, the why, the mission you're on, this is how you can get people to buy into it more effectively. Fiona shared that every month at SailGP, she runs an induction purpose session to explain a lot of those things, which they also treat as an open discussion. This shows commitment and transparency to the purpose, and those conversations also empower people to go forth and become purpose ambassadors in their own right. Now we know that people crave meaningful work, so these sessions are our chance to show them our company's why and the mission we're on while they're in open-minded mindset and in that mode of absorbing information like a sponge. The earlier we can get people to buy in and the clearer we are about the purpose, the more likely they are to carry that forward into the role. Lesson seven is to validate your ideas early, which came from a really recent episode about building agile HR and agile L&D approaches with Natal Dank. And she summed this up beautifully when she said, it's ultimately about managing risk. If I'm going to work on a product design or a project, I need to know that what I'm going to deliver is going to fix the problem. And I need to validate the evidence of that quite early on. I can't spend three to six months working on quite a large program or solution without knowing that this is exactly what the business needs. As the world becomes more complex and fast changing, there's so much we can solve and we can't do it all. As L&D teams, we need to be ruthless work out the important things to focus on and try to deliver value as early as possible. Then we can build it up from there. And there's loads of other benefits to this too. Essentially, we don't sink loads of time and money into stuff that doesn't work when we could easily find out if it would work far sooner. We don't get people invested in projects that ultimately fail and damage our L&D brand. And we also increase our chances of providing ROI by not diving into it head first and spending money before we know if it's going to work. And all of these things are a testament to why we need to validate our ideas early and then scale, iterate and pivot. Now lesson eight is exactly the sort of reason why I love doing L&D Disrupt because I hadn't thought about this until the guest mentioned it to me. And this was that we should allow people to spend their learning budgets collectively. Something Benita Mattia shared with me on our episode all about learning budgets. Because if we're really learning something that's building a new skill or a critical skill for future-proofing us, that will often involve taking us outside our comfort zone. And those are situations where we really appreciate being in a group as opposed to an individual. By the same token, if we're solving a team problem or plugging a collective skill gap, there's another motivation for us to learn as a group. And this is reflected in some of Benita's experiences that she shared with me. She said, There also needs to be a little bit of flexibility with the budget. And what we've seen is some teams saying, let's collectively pull this budget together and identify a way that we can upskill ourselves as a team. Now, one example that jumps out to me is public speaking, because this is really a shared problem that everyone would love to improve. And I go to a Toastmasters club every two weeks where I've seen lots of people come in groups. And it's this idea that if we're really going outside our comfort zone, it's much nicer to have someone with us. And when we leave that experience, we can share our wins, we can share positive reinforcement that makes us want to come again in the future. And actually, when I think about it in those terms, I can really see why you might want people to spend their learning budgets together. On top of that, there are loads of spillover benefits. Like if we're learning collectively, We might increase the chances of applying it because we're going back to the same environment. We might talk each other through the problems and how we used our knowledge. That also allows us to build uh, compound knowledge together and then foster these really great relationships that are built around learning and meaningful experiences that will grow with us in the future. Now, the next two lessons are really things I think people could classify as quick wins. Something you could take away to your job today, try it out and see if it works for you. And the first of those, tip nine, is to turn why questions into what and how questions. 
Now this came from the first episode of L&D Life Hacks and it's a combination of advice from Viv Cole and Georgie Cook. How we ask questions matters. If the framing or wording is off, then we might rub people up the wrong way, meaning they're less likely to help us diagnose the problems that we can solve for them, which damages the foundation of our impact relationship with people. So Viv Cole and Georgie Cook shared this great tip around reframing your why questions into what and how. And Viv said, there's a trade-off between finding useful information and the credibility that you have with stakeholders. If you ask somebody why in the wrong way and they say, I told you that already, then you'll get nowhere. And that's why we need to start reframing the questions and being really mindful about how we communicate, especially when we're trying to diagnose the problems to be solved. Thankfully, Georgie gave us two great examples. So why are we doing this could become what are the benefits you're seeing from this? And why hasn't this worked could become what hasn't met your expectations. If we're thinking of things we can validate and test really quickly, lesson 10 is a prime example. And this is to include focus and alertness exercises into your learning experiences. Something I took away from my discussion with Carl Chrysostomo, who some of you might know as Carl Learns. There's evidence that we can increase our alertness through things like breathing exercises or staring at a spot for 30 seconds. So in my mind, it seemed like a bit of an open goal for L&D teams to drop these into the start of pieces of content because they'll take less than a minute, get someone's brain more ready to learn, and therefore it might improve the likelihood of learning, memory, application in the future. So I asked Carl and here's what he had to say. L&D has an obligation as part of the development process to give employees the best possible chance of success. But one important factor when you're using something like this is to give the learner choice. We shouldn't make an exercise like this a prerequisite of doing something else that's part of the learning. So yes, we can include these alertness exercises and see if we get feedback that actually people found them really helpful for concentrating as they went through the rest of the content, but by no means should we be making them mandatory before people engage with our learning content. So this could be worth testing and validating if it's something that works in your teams. But personally, I've done this a few times, especially before the podcast episodes, and maybe it's the placebo effect, but it does feel like it sharpens my brain up a little bit from our individual brains to our collective brains for tip 11, because this is all about where we start for building a central brain in our company. And it comes from my conversation with Jennifer Smith about building a search first culture. Now, the reason I included this one is because the data is so alarming. So 55% of employees named finding and sharing organizational knowledge a challenge. 57% also flagged locating specific files and people with specific expertise as a difficulty, and almost a third are waiting days or longer to get information at work. Right now, knowledge is scattered across lots of places and people are context or app switching too often. But if the information is scattered in multiple places, then it's hard to find when you need it. If you can't find it, you have to ask for it and wait for a reply. And if you have to wait, the moment of need is probably passed by the time you get the reply. And that's why we need to centralize everything into one place and build this company brain. If you're struggling with where to start, here's some advice from Jennifer. If you have nothing in place or you're starting from scratch, there are a few phases to think about. And what you're trying to create is this positive reinforcement that when they search for something, they get this quick and easy answer. To start, ask what are the commonly asked problems or processes where there might be confusion. Tackling it in this way is how we can quickly build perceived value and reduce friction for people. It's a bit like the 80-20 rule. If 80% of the pain at the moment comes from 10 commonly asked questions or searches, solving them solves the majority of the problem and gets people to buy into the idea of searching before they ask. You can also view this as what are the repeat questions? Because if we capture a consistent answer to them, then there's a reason for people to search before they ask. So if you've got nothing in place right now, find out which questions and problems you can answer to have the maximum impact 
and build that in as the starting point for your company brain. Tip 12 really picks up where we just left off because it's all about learning ecosystems. Learning lives in a lot of places, but not just the ones that we would view as learning tech or learning tools. So whether that's people sending Slack messages to each other, listening to podcasts or YouTube videos, LinkedIn, WhatsApp groups, there's all these other places where learning is happening organically. And so lesson 12 is that it's not about building the learning ecosystem from scratch, but taking the friction and waste out of it so that people can get more value. This is how our CEO Nelson Sivalingham described the challenge. It's more that there's a lot of friction in that process. It could be something as simple as, how do I find relevant knowledge in the ecosystem or synthesizing this into something that's meaningful to me in this moment? While Katia Schipperhein, author of the book Learning Ecosystems, explained that alongside friction, we'll also encounter the problem of waste. She said, waste can be time, but it can also be not using all the knowledge that's already available in the ecosystem. I see this more with senior employees. They have a lot of knowledge, but they don't share it. And this is all waste if we can't use this together. Now, one thing I've heard multiple times is the benefit of auditing your tools and then mapping them out to understand how your ecosystem works in practice and where those friction or waste points are occurring. If you wanted to visualize that, you could use a Miro board or something like Whimsical to build it out but this will really help you identify where the friction points, the hurdles and blockers are in your learning ecosystem. Because as we know, the challenge is often not that the information exists, but it's that people can't find the information in the moments that it will have an influence on their performance. I really wanted to end with something positive for this last one. So I'm sharing this lesson from Hayley Brackley and it's that everyday actions make a better workplace for everyone. Now this was in the context of how we can support neurodivergent teammates, but it's a great universal lesson. Small changes that we make every day are the ones that have the biggest impact on our culture and people around us in the long term. So a specific example from the chat I had with Haley was the problem of surprise meetings. For a neurodivergent employee, they might really struggle with being caught off guard and it'll affect their ability to process information and therefore their ability to bring their best self to the meeting, which is something Ellie Middleton uh, explains in her great course, Nano Tips for Working Inclusively with Neurodivergent Employees. But the reality is that nobody likes a meeting being sprung on us, or at the very least, it will hinder most of us in how we perform in that meeting. So actually, this is an action that builds a better culture for everyone through a small action repeated over time. Personally, I can't stand that. If you get a meeting request on a Monday with no context and the meeting's on Friday, it's in the back of your mind for the whole week. So if people can just add that bit of context before they send the invite, everyone wins. And let's end with a quote from Haley on why these surprise no context meetings have to stop. She said, let's not spring things on people, but let's also not put in important catch up for tomorrow at two and then somebody is going to spend the next 24 hours thinking, oh my word, what is this important catch up? If you're looking for a a very simple three question framework to follow, it would be explain what you need from that person, why and by when. And those three things will give you enough context to put their mind at ease, help them prepare to some extent and change culture over time by making this the norm. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you everyone, not just for listening to this episode, but also the podcast in general. I cannot believe we're almost at episode 50. A reminder that you can join us live for that conversation on AI and L&D using the link in the description. I'd love to see as many of you there as possible and remember we'll be giving away a few prizes on the day too. Also, if we're not already connected on LinkedIn, I'll drop my LinkedIn profile link in the description for this episode too. Add me there and share the lessons you've taken from the show, anything you'd like to see on the podcast moving forward, and whether you like this kind of episode where we're reflecting on key lessons learned from the great guests we've had on the show. So once again, thank you all so much, and hopefully I'll see you for episode 50.